Hey everyone, it's Josh Schlossberg with the Green Root Podcast, the official podcast of Eco Integrity Alliance. It's been a little while since we have aired a podcast, but don't worry, we are going to be doing many, many more. You can't escape. This episode, I'm just going to be here by myself talking to you, and I'm going to talk to you about the state of environmental media. So, I'm going to start this off with an announcement, and it's a happy celebratory announcement, and it is that Eco Integrity Alliance just got a grant from a foundation based in the West. I'm not going to name the name because they asked us not to because they're afraid a bunch of other people are going to hit them up because they don't give out a ton of grants, but they have funded what we're calling our Rocky Mountain Wildfire Forest Media Campaign. So what does that mean? Well, I will tell you. I'm glad you asked. So consulting my notes here, because we have yet to begin it, but it will happen very soon, the Rocky Mountain Wildfire Forest Media Campaign. Well, the goal is across Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, Colorado, Utah, Utah, and New Mexico. We're going to balance the dominant narrative promoting unscientific wildfire fuel reduction logging. So, you know, I talk a lot about that. And right now it is the main campaign for Eco Integrity Alliance. Basically the idea of logging forests is somehow going to protect communities from wildfire. Not true. Eh. Opposite of true. We got to protect the homes. Don't log in the forest. Simple enough. You would think, but media reporting has been quite dismal. And you've heard me complain many times about it here but you won't hear me complain ever again. No, you will. But we're going to be taking more actions. And we have been taking actions. We've been experimenting with certain different things. And that is how we drafted this grant proposal. And perhaps that's why we got funded because it seemed like it was pretty well tested. So here are some of the things that we're going to do in collaboration with member groups and advocates. So we're going to collect the names and emails of hundreds of journalists across these six Western Rocky Mountain states that are reporting on wildfire and forests. And we're going to put that in a regularly updated database. So we have a lot of their names already in some states, but we don't have a comprehensive list. And in fact, we don't have it in most states. Um, We're going to craft and send biweekly. So every two weeks, we're going to send out a new press release from a variety of angles on this wildfire and forest stuff to these relevant journalists. So there are many, many ways that we can get at this and we're going to keep pumping these out there. And these press releases are also just informational posts and we write them in a way that they're easily accessible to the public, even if media doesn't pick up on them. So they do have a dual purpose, but I'll get to that in a second. We're going to compile and update a comprehensive list of the relevant studies on wildfire and forest. We do have a bunch of them, but they're not together in one big fat list broken down. I actually did something similar to this 10 years ago or longer for another organization for some of these, but it was only a small number of them. And there are many more that have come about since then. Just a place where you could just go down the line and boom, 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 boom. Here they are. And that's what we're going to do as well. We're going to make use of social media to share these releases and tag the relevant journalists and media outlets. But it's not just to let them know that we're putting it out there. You got to sometimes hit them from a few different angles. You email them and then you also hit them up on social media, but it's to kind of show the public, look, they know about this. If they don't want to report on it, they're making the choice not to. But these releases are, like I said, they're informational posts that are easily digestible. And so we're going to get these out to Rocky Mountain State residents via the Eco Integrity Alliance blog and newsletter and Facebook. Facebook, Instagram, X, Twitter, maybe some other places, along with specifically targeted ads. So some of the funding is now going to go towards ads because it can be difficult to bust through these algorithms. So if you pay a little bit of money, you bribe the social media companies, and then you target the ads based on what state they're in, maybe other interests, et cetera, information that's publicly available through Facebook. And hey, you know, don't shoot the messenger. I wasn't the one who gave my information to Facebook. You did. So that's that's how we're going to do that. And in response to the media coverage, if there's coverage in these publications, we're going to have our Eco Integrity Alliance members 
and member groups submit letters to the editor and opinion pieces to follow up on that conversation. Great. They wrote an article. Let's keep the conversation going. People care about this. We're going to engage in this. And then this might be my favorite part. And this is something that hasn't been done before. And I honestly think this is the most important piece. Some may differ. We'll see how it works. I've experimented with this a little bit, but haven't done a ton. So I'm really excited I get to finally do this. Media accountability reports. What is that? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to take articles that are written, whether in response to our press releases or just on the topic in other ways. Uh, we'll find these published media articles and we're going to rate them on balance and scientific accuracy. And we're going to share that through blog, newsletter, social media. So why is this important? Well, right now when an article is written, you know, again, this could be a good article. This could be a bad. It could be a middling article. It's just out there and it's done. There's no real accountability if it's a poorly written article and there's no real celebration and pats on the back if a journalist does a good job. And I worked as a journalist for many, many years. I still do in some ways, but obviously I'm doing advocacy, so I don't consider myself currently a journalist. Definitely not uh, uh, on, I'm not writing journalism articles on the issues that I'm doing advocacy for. That's definitely a conflict of interest. Uh, but I used to do that when I wasn't being an advocate and I would make sure to get as many perspectives as I could because I do believe in that and it's important in journalism. So, but what, what we're going to do here is if so-and-so writes an article, we're going to put out the information in the article, where they got it right, where they got it wrong and put out their name publicly. And it's not just to shame people. It's, it's to hold them accountable and also to praise them if they did good work. And that's the piece that hasn't been missing because I have interacted with many a journalist who just wrote a very bad article and for various reasons, which I will get into more in the podcast of why I think there's been a failure, but there's just like, I can contact them an email. They don't respond. You can do a, a post on social media that no one reads. There's not a lot of recourse. You write a letter to the editor that they may or may not run. But what if you can take that article and put it out through your own means with your own scientific analysis, what have you, again, based on my years of journalism. So I'm going to do that. And I think that's going to be a game changer knowing that if they don't do a great job, they're they're going to be held accountable publicly by name. And if they do a great job, people are going to know their name and that will hopefully advance their career. So we want to make journalists better. We're not just there to beat up on people. I'm not interested in doing that. And we want to promote those who are doing a great job. So that's the gist of that. And that's the Rocky Mountain Wildfire Forest Media Campaign. We're very, very thankful to our foundation funder, which will go unnamed. I swear it's real. It does exist. Uh, and we couldn't do it without them. We're really glad that they saw that the work that we're doing is important. And they did tell us that they're not funding a lot of places anymore, that this is the case with a lot of foundations. But they said specifically because we're working on this wildfire fuel issue, they haven't seen a lot of that work. So that's that's a that was a an amazing phenomenon, right? Because this is a harder topic to fund because most foundations either aren't interested, haven't heard of this, or actually end up supporting the logging. But uh, yeah, we have other grants coming through as well. We had another grant come through. It's the funding is happening, which means you're going to be hearing more from us. We're really excited about that. So let me get into the second part of this after the announcement. Yay, we celebrate. That's good. And I drink some water to ponder and reflect. Ah, oh, sweet water. Okay. Why does journalism often miss the mark? What are the reasons behind it? Well, again, as somebody who has been on all sides of it, right? I've been the person, hey, journalist, will you write this? I've been somebody doing advocacy journalism, something where, yes, I'm putting out accurate information, but it's really pretty much just one perspective. And then I did journalism, traditional journalism, where I'm talking to you know, it's people I don't agree with, industries, agencies, and getting their perspective as well as I can because I believe that was my job to do. And I'm not saying I was great in any way. They gave me a bunch of awards. I don't know if that means anything. I don't really think it does. The best pieces I wrote, nobody cared about. So whatever. But I have some insight. Let's just let's just pretend that's true. So 
what are these components that make it so a journalist doesn't necessarily do its job? And in this case, we have noticed this real failure on this whole wildfire fuel reduction stuff. Like they're incapable of writing pieces on it. Like they just, they're pretending it doesn't exist. And when they do write about it, it's often not good. Sometimes it is. So first of all, we can say, all right, hold on a second. Why, why would this even be a big enough deal to write an article about, right? Let's just start from there. Maybe these are just not important stories. Well, you can say, okay, 45 million acres of proposed logging isn't anything to talk about. I, I don't know if that would be something that's a fair argument. Uh, projects that are, you know, for instance, the largest logging project in Colorado history right now, 116,000 acres, lower north south vegetation management project in the Pike National Forest haven't gotten a single media outlet to report on that. Contacted three, and this is in Colorado, uh, three, put out three different press releases and nothing, maybe four press releases or whatever. And like, oh, so it sounds like your campaign is going to be a failure. Well, we have gotten a lot of media coverage in Colorado, but some outlets just aren't doing it. So that's what we're trying to figure out here. So is it, does it meet the standards of a story? Well, if any of you read a newspaper, you see all sorts of fluff in there. And I think we can move past whether or not giant logging projects, unprecedented amount of forest cutting is something that should at least be reported on, right? It doesn't have to be, oh, woe is me and one side version of this is just terrible and evil. Just say it's happening, right? They haven't done that. So weird. What's going on? Now, the other thing is, well, is it relevant to what the journalist is writing on? That's obviously a good question. If they do book reviews, don't send them scientific press releases. Well, the thing is, when you're contacting journalists who have written on wildfire issues, right? Forest issues, environmental issues, that's their wheelhouse. So I would argue that for sure, anything to do with wildfire logging, fits in their wheelhouse if they've covered wildfire, especially if they've actually covered wildfire logging, which they often have just from the just from the agency perspective. And I will say one one piece is that yeah, it often comes across these media articles as as just an agency press release. It uses their language, it makes all their assumptions and it's not something journalists want to hear, but it's not untrue. It it just factually, they just take the information from industry and claim that it's, there's not even a controversy out there. They're just saying, well, this is the objective fact. And that's a problem. So, all right, what, what are some actual reasons why journalists don't report on this topic or don't report well or whatever? Uh, I would say that the first is probably deadlines. So I know that a lot of journalists, particularly staff journalists, they have to put out a certain amount of articles per week. And so that means they can only spend so much time on stuff. So they end up writing a bunch of fluff pieces is the reality of the situation. Just, all right, the basic information, it's out and done. They go to the next thing. When I was being a journalist, when I was working as a journalist, I was a freelancer and I was an investigative journalist. So I took a lot more time to write these articles and I, I asked for more money because I was spending a lot more time doing them and doing all the research and getting lots of angles and talking to lots of people from all sorts of perspectives. A lot of articles you see are just kind of, they talk to one or two people that they already have in the queue and that's, that's boom, 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 bing, bang. So that's what happens, I think, a lot of the time. They just don't have the time to wade into a topic they might not understand. And that's the next piece. And it's that they don't necessarily think they can chew on the science, right? If, if there's scientific studies and there's assertions being made based on science, maybe they don't feel qualified. And so that's going to take longer, number one. But even if it took longer and they had the time, they may not feel like they could do it justice. So, well, the agency says this. I'm just going to report on it. What am I supposed to do? Read this whole study? How do I know if this study is one of a million and the other 
999, whatever, say something opposite. So they just don't do it, which is not a good excuse. But yeah, they don't make me feel comfortable or confident. I have been a science writer and I'm not a scientist, but you just take information and you be able to dissect it. And the thing is, I'm not, I'm not a great science guy, right? But I can understand it by simplifying it for myself. And I think my strength is that because I have to simplify it for me to understand it, I can then simplify it and explain it to the public. And I'm not dumbing it down. I'm not leaving pieces out. I'm just, I'm synthesizing it. And so, but not all journalists can do that or don't feel conf confident doing that, or they don't have a lot of practice in that. So I think that's part of it. I'd like to cover this. I just don't know if I could do it or I don't have the time. Right. So that's, that's being, what's the word, very generous. And I do think this is the case a lot of times. Now let's get into the little more smarmy areas. So this one's not so bad, but a lot of times journalists already have their contacts, their go-tos, and they're not really interested in new people to talk to, new sources that they have to vet and whatever or new stories to tell. They already, like, I want to tell this story over and over again. I, I already know about this, or I'm interested in this. I'm going to seek this out rather than, oh, here's this new thing I haven't heard of before in this press release. And I talked to a journalist recently, a currently working journalist, and he told me that a lot of journalists don't even look at press releases. They hate press releases. And I couldn't believe that. And that does put a little crimp in our, our plan, but there, there are ways around it. Basically, developing the relationship with the journalist. And that's what we're doing as well. But you usually start with a press release. But if a lot of these journalists, like we don't look at press releases and there was one journalist who actually said, take me off your list. And I was like, you're like, it's not a list. <laughs> it's like you're, you're a working journalist and you're email is up on the website and you write on this topic and I work on this topic. So I'm giving you telling you stuff that's happening, like ignore us if you want. But like the idea, almost the gall of don't even send me stuff. That's kind of where we're at for some of these folks, because I don't think there's been much accountability. So again, not beating up, not demonizing, not defaming, not libeling, but just like, okay, as a politician, you said this thing, we're going to put that out there and say, it's not great. Journalists don't really have that right now. So I think we could do a little more of that. So in the most cordial, accurate, polite, professional way, but it still has to be done. And yeah, they're just, they don't want new information a lot of times. And the, the secret to that is, yeah, if you develop a relationship with them and you kind of go to them in advance and you say, hey, we're, we might be sending out a press release, but in a sense, we're embargoing is the term. I just want to get this information to you. Do you want more information? That tends to work really well. But how do you develop a personal relationship with somebody that you've never met before, right? You have to start it with something. So that's that's the best angle I've found is start with that basic press release. And if they, they're at all interested, you can follow up with them. And then you have this relationship with them potentially that you can say, hey, we're hosting this hike. Is this inter interesting to you? Oh, I don't think we're going to do anything on that. All right, cool. I'll, I'll, I'll contact someone else. All right, here's where it gets a bit darker. You ready for this? All right, children should leave the room if they're listening. So there's some conflict of interest sometimes. And all right, I'm going to be perfectly honest. I know that when I worked for certain publications that there were certain topics that were ones that I knew would have a harder time getting through because of, say, an editorial bias, right? And I would pitch those articles anyway, and that wasn't always a great idea. But most people, if you work for an outlet, you, you, you're not going to do that, right? And so a lot of times it comes down to, it does come down to advertisers. It's not as simple as this pure corruption where the advertiser meets you in a smoky room and says, hey, you never write a story on fuel reduction, you know, or something like that. It's not that. It's just... And it's not even like, well, we don't cover that. It's just sort of in the back of the mind. This is the person who's paying attention, 
who is funding our newspaper that we've sort of jumped on with. And we got to be careful. It's just sort of like when you're talking to somebody and you're making certain jokes, you might tell different jokes to different audiences. And so that's the idea behind it. I don't think it's good. I think that you should write the story that needs covering, whether or not the the person is funding you. And I will say, and I'm not going to name any names here, but there is a media outlet I know that has never once covered this from a, the fuel reduction logging from an ecological perspective or even scientific perspective. And um, they did it solely from an industry agency perspective. And then over recent years, they just stopped reporting on it. as So they were promoting it for all these years. And now that it's all happening everywhere, they're just like, I don't know if they're regretful or they just don't know how to handle it. But I did find that one of these media outlets is sponsored by an entity that does this logging. Now, do I think that this is some slam dunk thing where pure corruption and this changes everything? No, and I'm not making it public and I don't name names and or anything like that, but it's a little bit, uh, I don't know what the word is. I'm paying attention <laughs> and I'm not sure what that means or it could be completely irrelevant, but it, it kind of made me a little bit worried. So there is some of that going on with the advertiser thing. The reality is a lot more and more media outlets are just kind of click based. So it's just what will get the most clicks, which I would argue, Hey, we got a controversy for you here. People love that. Right. So I don't know, but yeah, the editorial direction of an entity is often going to guide things. There, there are some entities, for instance, that are just really bad on, these issues. And yeah, I guess another example from the past was I found an entity, I kept pitching stories on biomass logging. So logging, this kind of logging for biomass energy, a uh, polluting energy source. And they would never cover it. They would never let me write an article for them and they never covered it themselves. And then I found out that their board was made up of three biomass industry people, you know, and, and they've since written articles that, yeah, they're not very good on the forest issue. They've written articles, you know, that were literally a, a former agency staffer who only interviewed a another uh, current agency staffer for their article. And yeah, so there, there's some weird stuff that goes on with editorial direction too. So you gotta you gotta be aware of that if that's just the the narrative and the ideology. And and that's ultimately, I think, behind a lot of this stuff. If a, if a publication has a particular ideology, we, we see this all the time with right-wing news sources, right? They only want to cover a thing that fits into that. Left-wing news sources do that too. You know, we may like those better, but that's what's happening there. And I would say even your a lot of your mainstream news has its ideology and, and their politics too. So what we're seeing more and more is that Unfortunately, a lot of this logging is being promoted not just by Republicans, but also by Democrats. And some of the biggest cheerleaders in Congress right now for fuel reduction logging happens to be Democrats. Our Colorado congressional delegation, we have John Hickenlooper, Senator John Hickenlooper, Senator Bennett, and Representative Negus. They're, they're going gung-ho for this stuff. And in Oregon, you have Merkley and Wideness senators and Val Hoyle as a representative. They have bills right now, this companion bill that's pushing for it's $30 million or $30 billion for more of this logging across the country. Some have even proposed $60 billion. It's a lot of moolah that could go towards actually making homes hardened, particularly for lower income people, retirees, people with disabilities, et cetera. So these media outlets, they lean Democrat. They, they just do a lot of them. Others lean Republican and they have that bias there. It doesn't mean they'll never report on something like that. But I do suspect that that's part of it. It's part of it that they don't want to make Democrats look bad because they're more on that team. I think they don't want to lose access to being able to go into Congress and speak to them. The journalist who sees a piece 
or a politician who sees a piece and says, yeah, I don't want that media outlet coming to talk to me again. They, they made me look bad. So I think a lot of this is unconscious. I don't think they're plotting it out. The journalists, I think in the back of the mind, they're just, I don't feel like doing that for some reason. And yeah, a lot of times, certainly in an election year, Hey, well, we, we don't want to make the sitting president look bad and have a chance for someone we think is way worse to come in. And I think that's a valid concern, but when it comes to, if your job is to report information to the public, then I don't think that's proper media ethics, I have to say. So that I think in a nutshell is what's going on with media. And yeah, I I think the positive elements that we can provide in our media campaign certainly is the accountability end. I do want to stress that, but that's not all of it. We want to educate journalists. We want to give them the information. We want to make them more comfortable reading the science and making sense of the science, or at least reminding them, look, there's another perspective here. Please, please report on that. I have never looked at an article where they get, say, Forest Service or Park Service that's doing the logging or even the logging companies or whatever, timber industry, saying something and then say somebody who wants to protect forests says something. I've never been like, why did you quote the bad guys? Never once in my life. I want them to quote that because I think their arguments are not very good and we can refute their arguments. So I want that all in one place. And I think a lot of us for years have wanted journalism to go more based on our own views and perspectives. And we, for those of us who are progressive minded, what have you, or environmentalists, we hate to see stuff that isn't pro environment, but there's a double edged sword here because what's happened is a lot of journalism has turned into advocacy. And I, I would argue a lot of politics, politicians have also turned into advocates. And then ironically, the advocates and a lot of environmental advocates have turned into politicians. They're trying to, well, let me see if we can find a middle road. It's like, that's not your job as an advocate. Anyway, I digress. So a lot of this is that we wanted journalists to be activists and a lot of activists went into journalism and that's put out a lot of great stuff that we might not have seen from some of the old school journalists that can, that can be debated. But the, the problem is that if it doesn't fit into their, their view of the world, their ideology, the lens through which they view the world, it won't count. And that's how we saw for years, environmental journalists would not report on the negative impacts of biomass energy because in their mind, they're like, well, we got to get rid of fossil fuels. Agreed because of climate change. Yes. This is a form that they're telling us renewable. We don't want to say anything bad about it. And then, so it took many years of many of us advocating, like, this is a dumb thing. You really just think about it for two seconds. You're going to log force and that's going to replace all the energy source. Like we got to draw down our energy use and and then if you're going to fill in the gaps with some less impactful energy, that that's one thing. But doing a worse kind of version as we just infinitely increase energy consumption is not the way out. Anyway, so that's that's kind of the problem that we're seeing. And because right now it is the Democrats who are also on board with this, these journalists are less likely to call it out. And yeah, we can't really expect conservative minded journalists to necessarily do that. Although on the economics angle, they might be more likely to call out tens of billions of dollars of funding for something stupid. So we're open to whatever their politics are. We don't care. Just do you want to protect forests? Do you want to, well, if you're a journalist, do you want to just talk about the idea of these forests are threatened and some people want to protect them? That's all we're asking for. We're not asking for anything more than that. And sometimes here's, the last thing I will say on this episode is who are the folks who have done the best job on reporting on this issue? So I, I've seen some decent articles from some, let's say, environmental media for sure. But the best articles I've seen, at least here in Colorado, that we were able to get coverage of was from some of the old school journalists, like the they're older dudes who have been doing this a long time and I don't know what their politics are, frankly, but I, I can tell you they're not 
protesting stuff out in the street, that kind of thing. And so they're, they're doing what a lot of people kind of look down on, like what people call both sidesism, like both, si- both sidesing, which yeah, for a terrible thing, like, Oh, what is, what is the murderer's view on this? Like, yeah, that would be a terrible version of both sidesing. But most of the time, not only do we need both sidesing, we need multiple perspectives. We need a spectrum of views. So I don't think that's a good term that people should use because I don't see how getting various perspectives is is a bad thing unless it's a ridiculous, absurd perspective. But call it something else, people. Anyway, so these folks are like, well, oh, there are trees being cut, larger trees being cut in this park, and which we were calling attention to in, in Jefferson County. It doesn't really matter. And these people are kind of up in arms about it. And these people, the agencies are moving forward with it. That's the story that counts. And so let me get into the story. What do these people have to say? I'm going to represent this as best I can. What do they have to say? Okay. I'll try to throw some science in here. And that's the story twice. The Denver post did great job. And why do they do a great job? Because they quoted us. I mean, I wasn't, I don't know if I was in, maybe I was in one of the articles. I, I, I put other sources in there to speak for it. I, I don't need to be the center of attention. I'm just some guy here. But we provided the information to them and they wrote a very good article, t- two articles, two different journalists, both old school journalists. And we were really pleased to see that. I will just say, I know that one of them has been kind of partially laid off Hopefully not because he wrote that article, but no, that's just the state of traditional media. So one of the best journalists who's been working for a long time is barely even able to to do do his stuff anymore. And he told me, yeah, I can't do any follow up on this because this isn't my beat anymore. So that's sad. We're losing the old school journalists. Be careful what you wish for with activism as journalism and we're hoping to turn the tide a little bit. This is just one grant, one project, but we think if we can model this uh, across the country, we might be able to start seeing a little more of a switch on this kind of reporting on this kind of topic. But guess what? You can use this model for other issues that are being underreported or misreported. And there is a way to have some sort of influence and engagement on this issue. If you're an average person, you don't have to become a journalist yourself. You don't have to be a full-time activist or advocate or what have you. We can do this. The media is very, very important. I think a lot of the difficulties that are happening in society today are because people don't have good information. We get siloed off into things based on, I only want to hear the thing I already agree with. And you know, you don't have to listen to terrible stuff all the time, but We can't make decisions if we don't have information. Politicians have no accountability without the media. That's the other really huge, important piece of media is that it holds government, it holds agencies accountable. But if we can't hold the journalists accountable, they won't hold the government accountable. Now, who's holding us accountable at Eco Integrity Alliance? You are. People who legitimately, genuinely care about natural world. If you have feedback for us, you have comments, you want to engage in Eco Integrity Alliance, you can help change it as long as you're operating in good faith and share our basic values. So tell me what you think about this episode, about the topic, about media, about our Rocky Mountain Wildfire Forest media campaign, about anything you want. And we'll listen and we'll do our best to get back to you. Thanks so much. Signing off.